I'm going to take off my mask for this. Is everybody okay with that? Yep. What's most important? Send me some gold coins for Dr. Scott and I'll take it out. Okay. Perfect. Now you guys can tell me when. We're all set. Okay. Hey, uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Craig Hallstrom. I'm the president of Electric Operations for Eversource. Um, you know, thanks for coming today. We wanted to get out in the field and just get a look at some of the devastation and the destruction from the storm. You know, here in Cheshire, we have, at the height of the storm, about 100,000 customers out. Uh, we have a big effort here of restoring. And I think you saw when you, when you came in, especially when you came around the other way, you know, the significant tree damage. And, you know, some of the takeaways that I saw, the trees not just broke the limbs, but many of them just fell over, root ball and all. So, you know, that's the kind of wind damage I think we saw with the storm. And that's uh, some of the reason for the widespread widespread devastation. Um, you know, we're about 48 hours into the storm, a little more. You know, as I said uh, at, at previous uh, sessions, you know, the first 24 hours, we really focus on safety, safety for the communities, the public, our employees, and we try to make the system safe. We work very hard with communities to uh, unblock roads, to get trees out of the way so they can have essential services. Um, and we also work real hard to free up any police or fire that may be standing down uh, watching wires um, with our folks. And we've been doing that, you know, like I say, for the first 24 hours, and we continue to do it. We continue to work very closely with the communities. You know, I know it's a, it's a very frustrating time for our communities and certainly for our customers, right? We're in the middle of the, the pandemic, the COVID. We just went through a heat wave. You know, what people really don't need is an extended uh, power outage. And we, we understand that. And we're working very hard. We're working uh, kind of tirelessly 24-7. And, you know, I, I'd, I'd be uh, remiss if I didn't give a shout-out to our crews. Uh, obviously, they've left their homes. They're working 24-7. Uh, we've brought in crews from all over the region, including the Midwest, Canada, Illinois, Detroit. Um, we're getting crews from Pennsylvania and um, we'll continue to get more crews. So today, yesterday, as I reported, we had about 450 or so crews. Today, right now, we have north of 700 electrical restoration crews, and then we have another, you know, probably five or 600 uh, wire-down people, um, damage assessors, back office people who kind of make this all work. Um, as of today, we've committed to 1,200 crews uh, that are arriving today and early tomorrow. And we're signing up more crews all the time. So um, by the end of tomorrow, we'll have uh, even more. So clearly, we will have uh, the right number of crews to tackle this uh, 
this um, outage um, as quickly as possible. You know, in terms of outages, um, we're about 519,000 customers out. Um, that's about 360,000 customers we've restored since the beginning of the storm. And again, the first part of the storm was really focused on damage assessment, make safe. So right now, we're really starting to ramp up. As you see, the crews here uh, really starting to focus on restoration of our system, the backbone, the main feeders, um, while at the same time paying very close attention and continuing to work with our communities, wired down road clearings and those things. So we're starting to go into somewhat of a parallel effort, but clearly our focus is on helping our communities, reaching out to them and making sure they get what they need. Um, yesterday reported we had some damage on our transmission system. Um, you know, I can report today that our five major lines are back. Those were lines that were, were feeding uh, substations that then, that then feed neighborhoods. Those lines are back, the substations are energized, and we're starting to restore customers on, on, those, um, on those locations. You know, some of the other things we do when you think about a big storm and you're bringing in thousands of workers from outside is, of course, lodging, food, materials, those types of things. So where you'll see in the area we're setting up staging areas. Uh, we have our, a large uh, staging area in Bristol, uh, Lake Compound Pounce, uh, where we're bringing in a company called Base Logistics that helps us with sleeping crews, feeding crews, and that'll, that'll end up being a large kind of line work of village by the time we're finished. Uh, and again, you, you know, you think about the pandemic, right? Normal, normally we would just spread people out in hotel rooms we have to do things a lot different. We have to make sure we keep people contained. We keep companies contained. We try not to mix across and uh, really focusing on the pandemic and uh, things like face masks and social distancing and all those things, which is, which is obviously very difficult during, during an event like this. Um, you know, this evening we will have a global uh, estimate on when our system will be restored. Um, you know, I believe, you know, I'm, I'm very confident that um, this weekend, by the end of this weekend, we will have a large, very large chunk of the customers uh, um, restored, and then we'll be working on uh, the smaller neighborhoods and services. So, you know, all in all, you know, you know of course, we, we feel the urgency. We know the urgency. This is uh, something that we have a very good plan that we, that we focus on, and, um, you know, I, uh, I think even today you're going to see a lot of people coming back by the end of the day. You know, you're talking about some of these plans that you guys have had and the number of crews you have. Yep. Do you feel that, you know, what do you say to people who say that those crews should have been here before that storm started? Yeah. So, um, you know, we have a planning process, and, you know, obviously it involves watching the weather. And I think, you know, you know more than anybody, you know, the storm wiggled its way up the East Coast. And we watched it starting last Friday. We committed to, to resources at that time. Uh, we brought crews down from Canada and um, other, other crews that we work with a lot. So we, we had a, um, what I think is a sufficient amount to start the process. Um, once the event happens and we know the, the damage, then we go into action and we, and we go through EEI, mutual aid process, and we bring more crews in. And like I say, by, by tomorrow, we'll probably have tripled or even more our crew complement um, than when we started. So when was the decision made to bring in uh, other, other crews, other contractors? Because we had an executive do an interview with us on WFSB yep. Wednesday morning saying the priority was going to be Eversource crews from other states because of COVID concerns. And there really wasn't a conversation to bring in other contractors from Canada, from the Midwest. Yeah. So when was that decision made? So when we when we talked last week, Thursday, Friday, you know, we were obviously very aware of the pandemic. And, you know, our states in the Northeast are doing well in that regard. So we tried to keep within the Northeast and in Canada because, again, you know, um, you know, they're doing very well in terms of the pandemic as well. We brought those resources in. Those are the resources we initially committed to. But... As soon as we saw the damage, we knew that wouldn't work, that we had to go. Traditionally, we go out to the Midwest. We go down to Florida. We go wherever we need to go. So as soon as we saw the damage the other day, we made that decision. We communicated that to our regulators because we had communicated prior that we were trying to contain where our resources came from. 
So as soon as we saw the damage, we said we have to go do what we traditionally do, reach out to all the partners that we traditionally use, and bring those folks in. So that, that was done very quickly. And what went into, what was the factors that went into the projection that you guys gave to Pura? Because it was obviously only a fraction of what we ultimately saw. Um, and, and certainly the forecasts were calling for high winds, which we, we did see. So what went yep. into the, the, the projection? Yep. So we have a planning process. And, of course, we have two different weather services. We pay attention to national weather. And then we work very closely with UConn. UConn does a, a damage prediction model for us that they've been doing for many years, and they have, met, they have a lot of experience with that. And they predict how many damage locations that we potentially would see from an event like this. And that's one of the factors that goes into that. And that, that storm prediction was on, um, you know, Monday night into Tuesday was around the 8,000 uh, 8, level. Previous to that, over the weekend, it was about 3,000. Because, again, you know, this storm kind of wiggled its way up, right? No one was really sure exactly where it was going to go. Um, so we use that as our predictive tool. And we declared on our plan what we call a level 4 ERP. And that level of damage is in that, in that declaration. Um, once we see what actually is happening, you know, we ramp up and, and adjust accordingly. Um, whether we declare a level 3 or level 4, it's, um, it's part of a planning process, and there's guidelines of how many crews and we and, and how many damage locations, and we were in that we were in those in those bandwidths with our level four declaration. So what was that forecast from UConn that was off? Like well, I, you know, it's a prediction of weather. I mean, you know, they have a lot of inputs. You know, they've been helping us do this for a lot of years, and and, they, and again, that's just one input. We have, like I say, we have two weather services. We have national weather. Um, you know, obviously, we listen to all the local local uh, forecasts, and. You know, we work very hard to, to figure out what's going to happen. But, um, you know, until it hit, uh, I, I, would, I would suggest no one knows exactly what's going to happen. Given, but, your, yep. given your company's history in the past decade um, of having these extended outages, um, was that even taken into account that, you know, you've had extended outages at least three or four times like this? Why not err on the side of caution? Well, we, we, we actually do. We, uh, we're very conservative in what we do and how we plan. Um, but we know um, that we, we put our plan into place. We do the best we can to determine how many resources we need. You can't, you can't hire thousands and thousands of crews uh, based on, you know, um, you, know um, you just want to be prepared. You know, economically, financially, that doesn't make any sense. We make the best predictions we can, and then we adjust accordingly. But what's the breakdown of people, contractors versus Eversource employees? Because one of the arguments for using contractors has been, well, you don't have to pay their benefits. I mean, you have to pay them something, obviously. But um, no. So well, when when you when you're in storm mode, um, you you take any resources you can, um, and there's. Uh, you know the the pay. I don't I don't I don't I don't really understand that question. We don't. We don't hire crews based on based on their benefits or their pay. You know, we have a sufficient amount of crews at Eversource every day, and that level is actually built into our rates, um, and we supplement that with contractors as our capital construction goes up and down every year. But you just um, said it wasn't financially prudent to have a lot of people on the ground here. And well, I meant for, for an event like for big storms like this, you can't staff for big storms like this day to day. You staff what you need day to day for your capital plan and your normal everyday storms, lightning, wind storms. And when you have events like this, this will be the, the second biggest storm in Connecticut's history. But all this extra work that you guys are doing, it's not going to affect customer sales at all or anything like that, right? Uh, at, at some point, the cost of the storm will go into customer's bills, yes. So even though we don't have any power? It'll be part of it'll be part of the rates, the cost to run the electric system. Yeah. Given the projections that you guys were going with going into the storm, and given that obviously there were landfall further down the coast, did you guys send any crews out of state thinking we would be covered? We did not. We did not. And that's you know, and that's that's we did not. We we, we and then again, so we we hired on Friday, 
because that's another thing we always look out for when there's a hurricane that comes up the East Coast. Other companies obviously get hit before us, so we have to get into the market and secure crews uh, prior to the event happening. So going forward, what's the strategy to deciding which towns, which areas are going to get it taken care of first? We, we, um, you know, we have a very kind of you know clear restoration methodology, right? We start with our transmission system because that's the power that brings us to the substations. We fix any substation issues, and then we get down to the street level. Um, we typically try to do the biggest outages first, but we take our system and we break it down into small pieces so it's manageable. And um, in the case of, of this storm, pretty much every town had some damage. So we're broken down into satellites, and those satellites will We'll deal with the biggest outages first, the main lines, what gets the most customers going. But, you know, it should come on pretty uniformly. You know, and again, we'll do the backbones, we'll get the main roads going, um, and then the, the, we also have uh, what we call low-voltage crews who they can't work on the primaries, but they can work on the services and the houses. So we hire them as well, and they're starting that work today, and that's so we can pull in the tail of this thing because the smaller outages tend to wait to the end. But... You know, we can, get, we can get a lot of crews who can just work secondaries um, in addition to primary crews like behind us. So Once the um, work's done here, yeah. um, how many customers will come back online? Do you have a... All well, so I, I, uh, this is part of a bigger outage from what I understand. So uh, just talking to the crews here, when, when they finish this and a couple other jobs, there'll be a couple thousand customers that'll get restored. Officials in the town of Vernon are claiming that... Um, 911 dispatch centers were overwhelmed after Eversource's outage hotline failed during the height of the storm. How did that happen? So we had some sporadic issues with our uh, outage map, as did some other other companies who used the same the same service. Um, those are, those are back up and running, and um, some some tweaks uh, were made to to strengthen the the, the uh, I believe it's beyond me memory storage, um, so the throughput. But those have been those have been resolved and. We're, we're back up and running. So what was the cause of the outage? Uh, you know, I, 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 I couldn't tell you exactly. Okay. They're also claiming that Eversource failed to address a previously identified priority critical circuits uh, to support life-sustaining and saving electrical power to a local hospital and public safety building. Uh, they claim that was identified after the October 2011 snowstorm. Do you have any comments? I, I, I don't know anything about that event, sorry. We could, we, can, we could get some more information. I don't know what that is. At that same press conference, they were complaining just in general about a lack of communication, and, and they, don't, they, weren't, they feel like they weren't getting responsive. I mean, they talked about stories about in one town, firefighters had to go in with fire extinguishers because of a downed wire. In another town, car, somebody was stuck in their car for an hour, and they just didn't feel like Eversource was being responsive enough. Yeah, so as part of our prep, I mean, we, we reach out to every community. We have a, a liaison, community liaison assigned to every community. We reach out to every community, we send emails to every community, and we make sure that we've connected their, uh, say, incident commander for their EOC and our community liaison. So, you know, at, at some level, in every community, there is people working with Eversource hand in hand. Um, but what's the reason for the delay in, for example, somebody stuck in their car for an hour or, or, you know, not being able to get to a fire because of a live wire? So, you know, you think about all the damage that we received in a very short amount of time across the whole state. Um, we, um, um, you, just, you just can't get to every location all at once. So uh, over the last, uh, you know, 24, 36 hours, we've been to more than, uh, I think it was 1,200 of these wire down calls, fire, fire and police level two calls. Uh, we had about 200 or so uh, fire and police one calls, which are, uh, life in danger, those ones get the first priority. Those were all cleaned up right away. There was about 200 of those. So, you know, we, we try to work very closely with the communities to identify their priorities, their roads that need to be uh, cleared, um, why is that need to be, you know, either tested dead or m removed. And, um, you know, the communication is there. Um, and we reach out. We have a very formal process that we make sure we have the right contacts for each community. Now, you know, whether we're going as fast as each community would like, you know, that's that's something we, we work hard to add, but we cannot satisfy everybody's needs all at once. With the, uh, the outage reports, we've been hearing from people that, you know, they'll get a notification that their power's back even though it's not. 
one, what should those people do? And two, how reliable are the numbers if things keep happening? Well, the outage, the outage numbers are very reliable. Um, you know, we know how many people are out and how many we've restored. Um, in some cases, um, you know, on a blue sky day, we communicate to customers that your lights have gone out, even if they haven't called us, and we communicate when, um, when they're going to be back on. And, and that's information that customers need and want so they can plan. When we have a big event like this, we ultimately will stop that once we can't keep up with it. So initially, there may have been some calls that went out, um, uh, but those have, been, those have been stopped. And then what will happen is as we go through our restoration process, and when a crew shows up at someone's neighborhood, and we know that those people's lights are going to go on, that those messages will be turned on for those people. So, you know, our goal is to it, it provide as much information as we can for our customers. Um, we're doing it through, like I say, through that process, our IVR process, but we're also sending out twice a day notifications to communities and customers. Uh, we send emails out to the customers whose email we have. So we're trying very hard to keep people up to date with what's happening. If the website was a, had a problem early on and there was, we've heard reports of people not being able to get through to, to say that their power was out, how can you vouch for the, ver the current veracity of the, uh, of the outage numbers right now? So the way, the way it works is um, it's, a, it's a model that rolls up. So we, we don't need everybody to call to say their lights are out for us to know. We also have you know, a lot of sensors and, and kind of smart equipment on the system that it tells us what's happening. So in many cases, we know the lights went out without customers calling us. Um, so, you know, so that's why we're, we're fairly confident that we know who's out. And you said you'll have numbers later tonight that will uh, projection of which, when the different towns will be back online? Uh, not, not towns that, as of yet. This will be a system. This will be an overall uh, repair estimate for the system. And then as we complete our damage assessment, we'll get more granular and get down to the town level. And how soon would that be? Uh, that'll, that'll most likely start sometime uh, tomorrow, tomorrow yeah. evening. Yeah. Eversource was approved for, I think it was like 300 or $350 million rate increase just for storm prep and, and system upgrades. We've been hearing from lawmakers and customers questioning how this, we could have uh, something like this happen with those rate hikes. I mean, why, why should they feel like that was money well spent? Um, well, well, the short answer is um, day to day, Connecticut has very good reliability. Last year um, was the best year ever in the state of Connecticut in terms of keeping the lights on and responding when they go out. So, um, you know, we operate the system well, we maintain the system well. Um, in a case like this, when you have trees actually fall over, the, the, the system's not going to stop that tree from keeping the lights on. You know, and that's that's kind of the crux of it. As I said, this is this will be the second biggest storm in, in the history of the state. Um, you just no matter how much hardening of the system you do, uh, a giant tree coming across the street is going to take that pole and wire it down. Hey guys, we're going to have to wrap it up because he's got to get back, and these guys got to get back for. All right, thanks guys. Should be good, right? Yeah. I mean, Can we get one number? Sure.